Turn in your copy of Scripture to Mark chapter 14. We're continuing this journey on the road to victory that Jesus paves, uh, not only as he's making his way to be killed on a cross, but as we celebrate the resurrection that is coming. So turn to Mark chapter 14 uh, as we look today at the Last Supper. While you're turning there, remind you of a couple of things. First of all, every time we gather together, we gather here for an audience of one. His name is God, and we have gathered here to worship and adore Him. One way that we as a church honor and adore God is by giving our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. And I want to encourage you uh, today to consider how that you might give your tithes and offerings to the Lord. I know that uh, for many, that is a new endeavor. It's something that you have not been a part of or really thought of, but Scripture tells us that part of our obedience to God as sons and daughters of God is giving our tithes and offerings to Him. Uh, like the widow that we looked at uh, several weeks ago in Mark chapter 12 who gave her two mites, or like the woman who anointed Jesus with uh, uh, an alabaster jar filled with priceless perfume. Uh, it's not the amount that is important. It's your heart that's important. So the question, as a follower of Jesus, I want to ask you, are you being faithful from your heart in giving to the Lord? Encourage you to give as an act of worship to Him. You can give online using the mobile app. You can text in. You can uh, write a check, put it in an envelope, put it in the offering boxes as you leave. But friends, if you're a follower of Jesus, be obedient in giving your tithes and offerings to the Lord. Second thing that I want to remind you of is as a church, we pray together. And uh, every day I'm going to invite you to join me on a journey of prayer. Uh, at one o'clock for one minute, I want to encourage you to pray this one thing. Lord, soak our souls in satisfaction through Jesus and help us show that satisfaction to all we encounter. This is our prayer this week. If First Norfolk is filled with uh, men and women, boys and girls who have been satisfied by Jesus and who show it to our neighbors, our coworkers, and our classmates, it will literally change the 757. It will literally change the seven cities of Hampton Roads. It will transform our culture and our community, and we will push back the darkness uh, that uh, we see around us. If we who are sons and daughters of God show the satisfaction uh, that we've received in Christ. So encourage you to join me at one o'clock to pray for one minute for this one thing. Lord, soak our souls in satisfaction through Jesus and help us show that satisfaction to all we encounter. And, and really, that's what we're going to do today as we journey together through Luke chapter 14. Now, the passage is from verse 12 all the way to verse 31. And let me kind of catch you up, uh, kind of summarize most of those verses. Because in this passage of Scripture, you're going to, uh, I'm getting ready to do some Baptist preacher alliteration. And if you're really into that, you're going to love this, okay? So in verses 12 through 16, we have the preparation for the Passover. And that's Jesus who has arranged things in the city of Jerusalem, and he sends his disciples to go and get an upper room ready to celebrate the Passover. We have this preparation for the Passover, and then in verses 17 through 21, we have a prediction of the betrayal by Judas. Judas, one of the 12 disciples, Jesus predicts that Judas is, he doesn't name him, but we know who he is because we've read the rest of the story. Jesus predicts that Judas is going to betray him. The other disciples are screaming, is it I, Lord? Is it our Lord? Is it I, Lord? I mean, they were uncertain about themselves. Uh, but uh, Judas, who we love to slam, Judas sold out Jesus for 30 uh, pieces of silver. Uh, but it was probably deeper than that. Jesus was not behaving the way Judas wanted Jesus to behave. And so in a fit of passive-aggressive or really aggressive-aggressive behavior, 
And Judas decides that Jesus needs to be put, put away, set aside. And he uh, betrays him. Uh, he becomes the inside informant for the Sanhedrin to bring Jesus to trial. Now, we're going to look at Judas more specifically in two weeks. But that's the prediction that happens. Then, um, uh, in, in verses 22 through 25, we have the celebration of the Passover, okay? Uh, and we'll come back to that. That's where we're going to focus in tonight. And then, verses uh, 26 through 31, we have another prediction. So, if you're an alliterative person, here's what we've got. We've got preparation for the Passover, prediction of betrayal, Passover celebration, and prediction of the denial of all the disciples. And this is familiar. You know that Jesus says, "Many will, uh, uh, all of you will be, caused to, uh, will be caused to stumble because of me on this night. And uh, then uh, he, uh, Peter says, not I. I'm not going to, even if everybody else stumbles, I'm going to remain faithful. And Jesus predicts, uh, even before uh, the uh, rooster crows twice, you are going to deny me three times. And all the other disciples said the same thing. We're not going to betray you. We're not going to deny you. Uh, We're going to stay faithful. We know that it happened exactly the way Jesus said it was going to happen, that the disciples betrayed Jesus. Now, uh, as we look at this passage, here's what we see. We see a bunch of broken people, and then we see Jesus. We see a bunch of people who have been shattered, and then we have Jesus. We have a world of humanity that have been ripped at the very core of their being, and then we have Jesus. If I bend over too quickly and I rip my pants, I can go to a tailor, and a tailor can mend my pants, but only God can mend a ripped heart. I have a car sitting in the parking lot. I don't know what's wrong with it. It belongs to me, and it has sat there for some time. I can take that car to the car repair place, and that car repair place person can fix whatever's broken in that car. But only God can fix a broken life. If I slip and fall on these steps that y'all been watching me Uh, play with for decades now. You see me right here at the edge, and especially when I get excited, you see me hoppity and hoppity. And one day, there's going to be a day, no doubt, that I'm going to take a step too far. I'm going to fall. I'm going to shatter my arm. I can go to Dr. Sam Brown with my shattered arm, and Dr. Brown can uh, provide healing for that shattered arm. But only God can heal a shattered soul. The message that I want us to lean into, the really the message of the Last Supper, is you have Jesus who is perfect in every way. He is unbroken. He is unshattered. He is unripped. He is absolutely perfect. He has uh, uh, absolute perfect satisfaction. He is consumed with absolute perfect contentment. He lives in perfect intimacy with God. And then you have broken people throughout this story. You have broken people all around this room. And only Jesus can fix what's broken in our life. Only Jesus can mend what's ripped in our heart. Only Jesus can heal what's shattered in our soul. Only Jesus. And you might not believe that. And if you don't, I pray that God through his word and by his spirit convinces you of that. Most of us here have tasted exactly what I've been talking about. 
And exactly what we're going to examine here um, in, in Mark 14, that Jesus celebrates at the Last Supper. And y'all know what the Last Supper was. It's, you know, we celebrate in a couple of weeks, we're going to have communion together. And many of you might think, well, it'd be natural for us to have communion on the day where communion, the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, whatever your tradition calls it, it'd be natural for us to have it on the day where you're actually preaching a passage on the Last Supper, Eucharist, communion, the Lord's Supper. That'd be natural. Yeah, kind of, but... When we celebrate communion together, it's when we're looking at the actual act of Jesus dying for our sin upon a cross. It's when we're leaning into his death on the cross for our sin. You see, the communion supper, like the Passover meal, is merely a commemoration of the actual act of Jesus going to a cross and dying for sinners like you and me. And being raised from the dead. It is as he takes the elements of the Passover meal, the bread and the cup, and as he fills the bread and the cup with new significance, not Passover significance, but brand new significance, we hear the promise of the Last Supper. That is that Jesus promises new life through his own death. Now, here's... Here's something that I don't want us to race away from too quickly. I don't want us, to, we're going to be using some familiar words. We're going to be looking at some familiar phrases. I don't want us to run through them and, and, and miss the significance of them. So I want us to lean into it a little bit. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the Passover. And, and for many of you, you understand what the Passover is. You have to go back to uh, the second book of the Bible, Exodus, to find the Passover the actual Passover. Uh, a thousand plus years before Jesus broke the bread and poured the cup in Mark 14, there was a literal Passover that took place where God spared the firstborn son of every home in Egypt that had the blood of a pure lamb plastered over the doorpost. And when the angel of death roamed through Egypt and saw the sacrificial blood on the doorpost, that angel of death passed over those homes that had that blood. The shedding of blood provided rescue for those families. And that was important, uh, an important piece of the Exodus. The Passover is a celebration not merely of that last plague on Egypt, but Uh, But it was also a celebration of what God did to set his people free from bondage to Egypt and lead them daily to the promised land. So in the first century AD, compared to probably 1400 BC when the Exodus took place, in the first century AD when Jesus took the bread and the cup and began to celebrate the Passover meal, There was a string of memory and tradition that Jesus was carrying with him in that preparation room. A string of tradition and memory of the Jewish people celebrating year after year after year on the day of unleavened bread, just before the feast of the Passover, celebrating how that God had rescued the people, his people. And the Passover meal literally through the shedding of the blood of a sacrificial lamb. Now in the first century, on this day, Jesus takes the meal, celebrating God's delivering of his people way back when, and brings it into the present tense, not just the present tense for the disciples, but for the the present tense for you and me. Jesus came to be the sacrificial lamb to pay the debt of sin that you and I deserved to pay. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus becomes the sacrifice. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. The apostle Paul says, Jesus Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Jesus becomes the sacrifice for our sin. His death promises life 
for those who deserve death. So as we look in Mark chapter 14, and as we look at this passage, beginning in verse 22, let's begin in in verse 21, just because there's something there I want us to see. Verse 21, Jesus says, now he's just predicted that there's going to be one of the 12 who betrays him. In verse 21, he says, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would, be, uh, would have been good for that man if he had never been born. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they drank, all, drank from it, and he said to them, This my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. As we look at this passage, I I want us to understand a couple of things. The Passover that Jesus was celebrating, he was bringing it the significance of the Passover into today, right now, and into the future. The Passover, uh, the Jewish Passover, was significant. It was part of God's plan, but it was merely a foreshadowing of what God had purposed to bring rescue, not merely to the Jewish people, but to sinners of all stripe like you and me. So when Jesus was celebrating Passover, he was bringing you and me into that conversation. But the question really is, at core, why? Why did Jesus have to be sacrificed for you and me? Why did Jesus have to die? Jesus had to die because you and I deserve death. I I want... want And I'm not just talking about a physical death. I'm talking about a spiritual death. You and I, this is what we deserve. And I know, man, we like to skip across this or we like to point out how bad people are around us or outside of us. And we don't really like to take a long look in the mirror and acknowledge and confess and see what your sin and what my sin deserves. Death. Our sin creates despair in our soul because it separates us from God. Our sin creates devastation in our lives, including our relationships. Our sin has an eternal destiny of death. And it's not just the big Hitler-esque kind of sins that deserve eternal judgment. It is your sin. I'm getting all revivalistic on you right now. It is your sin. It is my sin. No matter how small we might categorize it. No matter how minuscule we might think it. It is my sin that deserves literally demands eternal judgment. Why? Because God is holy, and he will not relinquish his holiness for anything. But God is also loving, and he wants to have a relationship with you and with me. So here we have this dilemma, the dilemma of humanity where sin has been our daily diet. And guys, I know it's yours. I know it is. We like to minimize it. We like to say, well, you know, you know how bad they are. I'm not that bad. That doesn't matter. The measuring tool for our sin is not how bad other people is, how how, uh, bad other people are. The measuring tool is how holy God is. Because God is holy and just, he must punish sin. But his love has provided a way for us to be rescued. And that's what Jesus was talking about here. 
That's what Jesus was about to fulfill in his own death on the cross. He was building a bridge for sinners like you and me. Now, here's the picture. My sin has ripped a hole in my heart, and there's no way for me to fix it, but Jesus can. My sin has broken my life irreparably, except Jesus can make it whole. My sin has shattered my soul to pieces, but Jesus can put it back together again. Here's the good news that we look at here, and the reason Jesus took the bread and the reason Jesus took the cup is to give this promise that there is rescue available through his own sacrifice. The bread, he said, this my body. He's saying, here, here I am physically. I'm going to give myself up so that you might be satisfied in life and even in death. Jesus said, this my body. I give it up so that you might feast on satisfaction in the family of God. He took the cup. He said, this my blood of a new covenant. Not one built on if you do enough right stuff, you're going to get away with uh, doing wrong stuff. No, 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 no. A new covenant, a new life, a new promise. Marked by God's grace towards sinners like you and me. That we can enter God's family not based upon anything that we do. Nothing. Zero that we do. But based wholly and completely on what God has done for us in Christ. Jesus said, I'm going to give my life so that you might live. I'm going to die in your place on a cross. You've committed the crime. You got to do the time, except I'm going to do the time for you. My goodness gracious, just, just, just think about it. I mean, just, just think about it. I'm a sinner. I've chosen to rebel against a holy God. I'm a sinner. I'm the one who made the choice to tell God he doesn't know as much as I know. And he's not as smart as I am. And he doesn't understand me. And so I'm going to do it my way. I'm the one who made that choice. I'm the one filled with arrogance and self-importance to say, I'm more important than the one who has created me. (laughs) And God looks, and he doesn't just bring the hammer down, although he should. God looks and he says, that poor pitiful soul. That Eric Thomas, man, I want to rescue him. And so he sends Jesus to die on a cross for my sin in my place so that I might be forgiven and brought into his family. I was living an empty life filled with despair and devastation and death. That's who I was. I was a stranger to the covenant of promise, but God in his mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when I was dead in my sin, he made me alive together in Christ Jesus. I've been saved by God's grace. Now look, I know know that you've heard this before. But can I tell you, you can't hear it enough times. I know there are some who say, man, I just wish that Eric Thomas would preach more doctrinally deeper sermons. I just, I just wish that Eric Thomas preached preach a sermon that has greater specific application to my personal life. I get it. I understand what you're saying. But can I tell you 
The simplicity of the message today in the text from which we read is the core component of who I am and who you are if you're a follower of Jesus. There is nothing deeper than the simple truth of this gospel message. And if we don't get this right, we won't get anything right. Jesus died for me, a sinner, so that I might be forgiven and find life in God's family. I was dead in my sin and my trespass, but now, now I'm alive. I was a stranger to the promises of God. I couldn't find satisfaction. I couldn't find hope. I couldn't find meaning. I couldn't find anything. I was a stranger to the promises of God. But now through faith in Christ being made alive in him, I was once a stranger, but today I'm a son of the living God. We're no longer strangers. We're now sons and daughters of the king. Good gracious, great balls of fire. How exciting. My soul, new life does that to us. It should, it should birth in us excitement, anticipation. I've got a granddaughter. Her name is Nora. She gave me a tattoo. I'm going to have another granddaughter birthed on the other side of the womb. I've already got her. When she's going to be born, we pray, any day now. I, ooh, ah, it's exciting, right? My goodness, it, I mean, tears of joy, celebration. Why? Because new life does that to us. And guys, Jesus has given us new life. If you have tasted what I'm talking about, if you've experienced that new life in Christ by placing your faith in Jesus, stop trying to live it all your own. Stop trying to make good on what you've already made bad. When you come to the end of yourself and all your efforts and you acknowledge I am a sinner before a holy God and I deserve nothing but judgment and yet Jesus came to give me life through his death on a cross and his resurrection from the dead. If you've tasted that then you know what I'm talking about. It's hard not to be excited and guys, I'm telling you, this is the core of who you are. If indeed you're a son or a daughter of the living God. There's nothing deeper, more profound than this truth. I was dead in my sin and Jesus saved me through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. If you haven't experienced it, then you just see a guy getting up here frothing at the mouth, getting all excited about something. It's not even, he's, he, he's getting ready for March Madness or something. I mean, if you haven't experienced it, you don't, you don't understand it. If all you have is a religious journey of philosophical ideas, and that's how you define your relationship with God, if you have not really settled into the fact that your sin, your sin, no matter how minor or small, your sin has separated you from a holy God and has destined you for an eternity of judgment and settled into that, then, then all this stuff that I'm talking about and that Jesus talks about here, doesn't, I mean, it, it's nice that, he, that we have this ritual that we follow as, as, even as Baptists, we have this ritual that we follow called the Last Supper. But let's not get all excited about it. Oh my goodness, not get excited about it. This is life versus death. This is, this is being broken or being whole. <laughs> this is being shattered or being healed. This is being ripped apart or being mended completely. I'm telling you, this is something to get excited about. If you've tasted it, if you've experienced it, if you haven't, I beg you today, choose Christ. Come to the end of yourself. Stop trying to do it on your own. It's a futile effort. It's a journey that ends in despair. Stop trying to find a doctor or a mechanic or a seamster, seamstress, a tailor to fix what's broken. Only Jesus can do it. Turn to him. Trust in him. Acknowledge your sin before a holy God and claim Jesus as your only hope. 
if you are a follower of Christ, I want us to take two things that Jesus did in this passage, and I want us to make it our daily pursuit. If you have been made new through faith in Jesus Christ, if you have received the promise that Jesus offers here in this passage, I encourage you to bless God for his amazing love. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he blessed it. A very common thing. Passover meal, you took the bread, you broke it, and you blessed it. Not just at the Passover meal, but at every Jewish meal, you took the bread, you broke it, and you blessed it. Blessed art thou, O God, King of the universe, for this bread you have given to us. That was the prayer. But when Jesus broke the bread, he was filling that moment with new significance. No longer it was just a loaf of bread, but that loaf of bread, he said, this, my body, broken for you. He was saying, this this is the picture. It it paves the way. It points to. It it reveals. it, It unveils what I'm about to do for you. This, my body, broken for you. And Jesus was claiming himself as the bread from heaven that gives life to every person who follows him and believes in him. A perfect satisfaction that will never fade and doesn't give way. It is life that we always wanted. It is life that we always needed. It is found in Jesus. And Jesus said, now, here's the bread. Let's bless God who gives it. No, we need to wake up in the morning like the Apostle Paul did when he was writing to the believers at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Bless the Lord who has blessed us so richly, not because we deserve it, but even in spite of not deserving it. He's blessed us. He's blessed us with an amazing, amazing love that reaches beyond the chasm that our sin has created between us and himself and builds a bridge so that we might be brought into his family through faith in Christ. Here's the love that God has shown us. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us. And he sent Jesus to pay the price for my sin, for your sin. If we would wake up every morning blessing the Lord like that, saying a good word about the God who loves us, if we'd wake up every morning with this mental picture of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, all of them filling our lives through faith in Christ. If we'd wake up and stop leaning into the waves of chaos crashing into us, but rather lean into the glorious God who loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die in our place upon a cross, it will change our outlook on the day. But more importantly, it will tell God, I'm thinking on you, and I'm thankful for you. To bless, literally in the Greek language, means to say a good word. Oh, what a discipline it would be if we would take every morning and we would say a good word about God's goodness toward us. All my life, my favorite song, my favorite song right now. All my life you have been faithful. All my life, you've been so, so good with every breath that I'm able. I'm going to sing about the goodness of God. Not because I'm faithful. He's faithful in spite of my unfaithfulness. Oh, my goodness, what waves of love he's poured toward me. A sinner saved by his grace. Look, we need to bless the Lord for his amazing love. And then Jesus took the cup and he poured it. And he gave thanks. Not only should we bless God for his goodness, we need to give thanks to God for this new life that he's given us. It's a life that we have not earned, but that he's given by his grace. We didn't earn this life. 
this relationship with God, this intimacy with God. I'm no longer distant from God. Now I'm intimate with him. Because of what Jesus has done and because he has sparked in my heart the faith to believe on Jesus and I abandon myself into his grip and I live in intimacy with him, I'm no longer um, absent from God, but I am with him, he with me. (sighs) Thank you, God, for this life, a life purchased by the death of Jesus Jesus said, this, my blood, that marks a new covenant, shed for the many. Today, I I think we need to just go back and remember that the only healing for, the only healing for a shattered soul, the the only fix for a broken life, the only mending of a ripped heart is Jesus. Him dying for our sin upon a cross. It is the shedding of Jesus' blood that gives us life. Ephesians 1, 7, uh, Paul said it this way. Now, this is the same passage where he begins, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Uh, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and uh, blameless before him in love, in love having predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters, uh, uh, that we might live according to the praise and glory of his grace. Verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. That's what... That's what Jesus was doing when he took the cup and he thanked God. He was thanking God that he was about to die to build a bridge between sinners like you and God himself. He was thanking God that he was about to shed his sacrifice so that we might be made whole. Look, if Jesus can thank God in the face of his own death, maybe maybe that teaches us a lesson about how we can thank God. It's easy to thank God when things are going well. Next week we're going to see Jesus grieving over the sacrifice he's about to make. It's easy to thank God when things are going well, but what Jesus teaches us here is Everything around us might be going to hell in a handbasket, but if I'm with God and God's with me, I'm okay. So I thank you, God, that I'm your son. I thank you, God, that I'm your daughter. I thank you, God, that you brought me into your family. God, I have a reason for thanksgiving. See, as followers of Jesus, God does everything we need to be satisfied in every way. He has given us himself so that we might soak in the satisfaction as sons and daughters of his. We're part of his family. And we can be satisfied. Never hunger, never thirst again. All because of Jesus. So as as I close this down and land this plane, can I ask you maybe for you to consider something? As followers of Jesus, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I beg you, come to Christ today. And at the close of this gathering, if you have questions about it, go to our next step station, ask somebody there at the tables there, right in the middle, just say, I, I need to know more about how to become a follower of Jesus more about what Eric was talking about. I, I want to know more about that. Help me. Somebody help me. I want to help you. You come to the next step station. You can take one of those blue cards right down on it. I need somebody to help me uh, become part of God's family. Do that. If you are part of God's family, if you've been rescued by God's grace through faith in Jesus, I want to ask you to do something. 
See, one of the great joys that we have as followers of Christ, if we're living by blessing God for his amazing love, and we're doing that every day, and if we're living by giving thanks to God for this new life he's given us, then it's going to shape the way we live at work, in our neighborhood, with our classmates. It's, it's going to shape how we live. Our satisfaction isn't found in what we've got or what we're doing. Our, our satisfaction is found in Jesus. And it's going to show. But one of our missions as a follower of Jesus is to show and to share that satisfaction with others. You know that prayer that we're going to pray together? Lord, soak our souls in the satisfaction through Jesus that we might show that satisfaction with others. That's that's what I want to ask you to do. That you would lean in so fully to the satisfaction you have in Jesus by blessing God and thanking Him. That then you would look for opportunities, not merely to be satisfied in yourself, but to be satisfied so that you might show it to someone who is far from God. One way that I want to challenge you to think about doing it, between now and Easter, would you host some people in your neighborhood? Invite some neighbors to come to your home, neighbors that that are disconnected from church or you're not sure about their relationship with God, invite them to come into your home. Give them some coffee and some dessert. And don't make everything about this. In your mind, it will be because it's all you're going to be thinking about. But somewhere in that one or two hour span of time, take the opportunity to share with your neighbors how that Jesus has satisfied you. And you want them to find that same kind of satisfaction. I mean, it's aggressive. I know it is. I, I know, my goodness, that, that, that's out there. We can get together and we can talk about March Madness all day long. But my goodness, to have people over for coffee and dessert and say, Jesus is the reason I live. That's a different game altogether. But it is who you are, First Norfolk. This is who we are. Is who God's made us to be, that we would be missionaries like that. So I want to challenge you between now and Easter, will you do that? Will you think about it? Will you pray about it? Will you sweat it, you know? And then let's see what God can do. Can you bow your heads with me, please? Oh, God in heaven, we know that you have been gracious to us in sending Jesus to rescue us, that you have given us new life through Christ's death and his resurrection. I pray that as Easter continues to approach us, that we would become more and more consumed with the foundation of what our life is built on. That we would be consumed with you, Jesus, the focus of our life. That we would celebrate this new life you've given us, That we would wake up and throughout the day bless you, Lord, for your amazing love that called me a sinner from death into life. And that throughout the day I would give thanks to you, Lord, for giving me this new life, all because of Jesus. I can't fix myself. I can't heal myself. I can't mend myself. But Lord, you have and you will. So we bless you, Lord. And we thank you.